Hello and welcome to a Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome to you regular listeners. I'm so thankful that you are here today, and welcome to anyone who has found us for the first time. I'm so thankful that you are here. It's no accident that we're here together today, friend, and so please stick around for a bit. Don't run off quite yet, and let's see what the Lord has for us today as we're spending time for in His Word. You know, this is episode 250 for this year. Uh, we're on the 250th day of the year, and I just love getting to share with you what I'm learning as I'm spending time in His Word, and um, I just love walking along this journey with you. Uh, I pray that you're not here just to listen to me. It's not me. It's not what I have to say, but that we're thinking about the word, that we're pointing uh, our hearts and directing our hearts and our minds to God's word. That is what is important. And so I just love it that we could do that together. I wish I knew who all of you were. I wish I could sit around a table with you or on some comfy chairs and we could talk about Uh, this in person, but for now, that's not the way the Lord has it, and so we'll just continue in what we're doing. Uh, Please consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone that you think may receive a blessing from it. Know that I pray for you regularly. I continue to pray that the Lord would draw you closer to Him and give you more of that desire to know Him and to know His Word, and that you'll be very intentional about spending time with Him. And know that I love to hear from you. So if you feel so lit, send me a message sometime. Let me know what the Lord's doing in your life as you're spending more time with him. Well, our verse for the day for the sixth day of September 2024 comes from the Old Testament major prophet book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. And it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Oh, friends, you probably recognize this uh, because these are things that we uh, are reminded of frequently, especially as we get into the Christmas season. Um, And so I'm just excited for us to park here, see what was going on in this prophecy and talk about how uh, Jesus fulfilled that. And uh, it's just such a blessing to see this. I love it. Of course, when we see uh, that things were prophesied and then God brought it to pass. I love it that we see uh, that the things spoken of uh, concerning Jesus in the prophecies have come to pass and are coming to pass. It's just such a blessing. I love it that we see exactly where we can find it. And I hope you get excited about that, too. Um, You know, when we think about where we are in the scripture, we are in that section, as I mentioned, of the prophets, of the major prophets. Um, We know that the Old Testament begins with the five books of the law, then it moves to Old Testament history, then what is known as the wisdom and poetry literature, and after that, we get into the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets were called major primarily because they were larger works, and then the minor prophets tended to be smaller Um, Not always, because Daniel's book of prophecy has fewer chapters than uh, a couple of the minor prophets, but that was a general rule. Um, The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Lamentations is stuck in there uh, next to Jeremiah because he's thought to have written both of those. I love it. Of course, you know, I love all the words and all the verses, but oh, I get so excited when we're in Isaiah's prophecy because I just love the way that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write some of the things that he wrote. Uh, Just some beautiful uh, word pictures that we have, and it's just such a blessing. But let's think about uh, Isaiah, think about his book, and you know, 
let me just say first, and, and we'll go on this uh, trail for just a minute, uh, because any time we're in the books of prophecy, and I, I've told you this frequently before, uh, they used to make me a little nervous uh, because I would think, gracious, I don't n- understand all of this. I don't know all these places that they're talking about. Uh, but thanks be to God, the more that we spend time there, the more that we are able to look at these things and just see uh, that we get to see the character of God in these books of prophecy. We get to see him declare uh, his promises, and then we see later where they're fulfilled, and I just love that because our God is a covenant-keeping God. None of his plans or purposes will be thwarted. If he says something is going to happen, it is going to happen. And I love what we see in this Old Testament and in these books of prophecy several times where you would see uh, the the prophet write, thus says the Lord, or hear this word from the Lord, or the Lord would speak to the prophet and say, uh, recall this to mind. And, you know, I just love that because we're getting to hear uh, directly from him. And we do that all, all throughout his word because all scripture is breathed out by God. And it is all profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. So it's important that we spend time here. Um, I've heard some people say, well, we don't have to worry about uh, all that Old Testament su- stuff since Jesus has come and, and we're no longer under the law. But I would say, no, this is part of the of the story. Uh, We go all the way back to the beginning of time and all the way through what will be the end of time as we know it. And it's one big story. And we learn so much about God and his uh, character and his ways. And I'm just so thankful for that. We can think about the books of prophecy um, based on Uh, to whom the original book was written, to whom the original prophecy was given, and also the relative time period. And uh, we can think about those uh, because when God chose these prophets, um, originally each book, each message was given to a certain people. And, um, you know, those, those same people that think that we don't have to uh, worry about the book's prophecy, say, well, those were given to like the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom or this, that, and the other. But uh, again, I would say uh, we see so much. We can learn so much about God and uh, about the way that he uh, cares for his people, the way he disciplines his people, the way he corrects, and uh, about his faithfulness. And I truly think that one of the devil's schemes, one of his tactics is to try to get his people to ignore parts of the word or to say that, oh, well, that doesn't apply. And so we must be very careful about that. We are not unaware uh, of his crafty schemes. Uh, We are aware of his crafty schemes. And so uh, we need to be in this word. God gave it to us for a reason. So you may recall, if you've been on this journey with me very long, or if you've studied the Bible uh, very much at all, that there was what was known of as a a united kingdom of Israel under King Saul and under King David and under King Solomon. But Solomon was disobedient, and that kingdom was split because of his disobedience. And so it was split into the northern kingdom, of Israel, that's that was its name. There were ten tribes, uh, and then the southern kingdom of Judah that had two tribes. So many of these prophecies, you'll hear it uh, say that they're given to Israel and then to Judah. And so we have two main prophets that were tasked with sending messages to uh, Israel, and those were Amos and Hosea. Uh, We have a prophet that was tasked with sending a message to Edom, and that was Obadiah. There there were prophets sent with messages to Nineveh. Those were Jonah and Nahum. All the rest went to uh, primarily that southern kingdom of Judah. Two of those 
Daniel and Ezekiel were during the time that the people were out in the southern kingdom of Judah had been exiled to Babylon. Uh, But the majority of those, more than half of the books of prophecy that we have, uh, had messages for that southern kingdom of Judah. We can look at the time period. Was it before the exile? Was it during the exile or after the exile? The pre-exilic prophets uh, refer both to the uh, the time before that northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria, and then the time before the time that that southern kingdom uh, was conquered by Babylon and people were carried off. There was the exilic prophets, as I just mentioned, Daniel and Ezekiel, who wrote during that exile when um, some of the exiles had been carried off to Babylon from Judah. And then there's three post-exilic prof- books of prophecy, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, written after the people came back, after that remnant came back from exile and began to build the temple and rebuild the wall. And so that's, um, it's helpful for me to think about things that way. Um, and that helps us kind of divide it up and to keep it straight in our mind. So Isaiah's book is one of the pre-exilic books of prophecy. And he wrote, um, a during a time that spanned about 50 years, <clears throat> he was primarily writing to that southern kingdom of Judah, but God also gave him words for uh, a, a few words for that northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and he wrote during a time that was before and during the time that Assyria, I'm sorry, ah, that uh, Northern, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by Assyria. So he had some warnings for them, um, but most of it was leading up to uh, before the time that that southern kingdom was carried off by Babylon. Jeremiah talks a great deal about that coming, uh, that the the Babylonians would be coming to conquer uh, that and carry off that southern kingdom of Judah or people from there. And so We could go to the very beginning of Isaiah's book of prophecy, and it'll tell us the time period that he uh, was prophesying during because he tells us what kings he prophesied under. It says uh, in Isaiah 1-1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he beheld in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So there's... uh, Four kings that he prophesied during their reigns. I love that. And this beginning chapter sets the whole tone uh, because, remember, God sent the prophets to uh, speak to the people. He gave his message to the prophets to give to the people. And generally, the people, there would just be a few that would listen and many would not. But uh, God had sent them to warn the people, to encourage them to turn back, to encourage them to turn away from idols and turn back to him and to be faithful to him and not to the things of the nations and to get their hearts right with him. And um, he gets he describes here how he sees the people. And uh, so it says uh, right here in Isaiah chapter one, verse two, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh speaks, sons I have reared and raised up, but they have transgressed against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not perceive. Alas, sinful nation, people with heavy with iniquity, seed of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, they have forsaken Yahweh. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. They have become estranged from him. This is God speaking to how he sees what uh, the people have done, and how they've turned away. He said, where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it. Only bruises, wounds, and raw wounds, not pressed out, not bandaged, not softened with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. 
Unless Yahweh of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. You give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says Yahweh? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats I take no pleasure. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of convocation. I cannot endure wickedness in the solemn assembly. My soul hates your new moon festivals and your appointed times. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Indeed, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, purify yourselves, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, execute justice for the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be eaten by the sword. The mouth of Yahweh has spoken. He laid it out right at the beginning. He started out Isaiah's prophecy and said, this is how I see you all. Um, and even talked about their worship. He didn't want to hear from them because their hearts weren't right. They had turned away. They weren't truly worshiping him. It was just going through the motions. And then as we see throughout Isaiah, though, he would give the, um, this is how you have sinned against me, but then he would encourage them to turn back. And I love that. I love that we see that all the way through because that's the character of God. He calls out our sin. We have to uh, reckon with that and realize that we are sinners. And then he says, but turn back to me. And so that's how this opens up. And you will see that uh, played out several times throughout this book of prophecy. And then also before we get to our chapter 9, we see in chapter 6, and we've talked about this quite a bit before, um, Isaiah's experience when he saw the Lord, he was able to see into the throne room. And it says that he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And uh, I just love that. So if you get a chance to read, go and read that chapter, first part of chapter six of Isaiah, because he was able to see the Lord. And then I love the example, because when he saw that and he saw God in all of his holiness, he realized that he was unworthy, that he was unclean and uh God sent the angel to touch his mouth, and um, he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And that's what happens to all of us when we realize how holy God is and how unholy we are by ourselves. And uh, then we read that uh, God gave Isaiah more of this commission of what he would be doing and that it would be hard because he would speak to the people and sometimes they would be dull of hearing and their eyes would be dim and it was a spiritual uh, problem with their hearing and a spiritual problem with their vision and uh, so it was going to be difficult but God was still going to use Isaiah and he continued to give them give him um, things to tell them he he told them that um there would be trials and difficulties that would come for Judah and that the Assyrians were coming to invade that northern kingdom. And so I want to pick up here at the end of chapter 8 and then read forward to our verse for the day. It says in chapter 8, verse 19, it says, Now when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their gods? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn and they will pass through the land hard pressed and hungry. And it will be that when they are hungry, they will be angry and curse their king and their God as they face upward. 
Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be banished into thick darkness. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later he shall make it glorious. And this is talking about God. By the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And I just have to pause there. When you think that uh, that is where Jesus first started his ministry, that light truly shone in the darkness there. Ah, I just love it. It says here in verse 2, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall make great their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for you shall shatter the yoke of their burden and the staff of their on their shoulders, the rod of their taskmaster at, at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the rumbling of battle and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for fire and then here's our verse for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father prince of peace and i'm going to just read past it there will be no end of to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. So this is this prophecy that even though it had been difficult for Israel, because that's where Zebulun and Naphtali were, um, even though they had walked in darkness and there was much difficulty, you know, the Assyrians were going to come in and get and invade. Um, but the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And that's talking about Jesus, who is the light of the world. You know, I love what we read in John chapter 1 where it talked about the Lord Jesus coming and it says all things, and this is verse three, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overtake it. So that's talking about that light that shone. And then we hear about this son that would be given, but for us, a child will be born to us. A son will be given. God gave us this gift. He he sent Jesus to us. And it says, And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting. Or th this version says Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And when I think about those things, when you think about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and now in Colossians, we read that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So he's what we could see of the invisible God. And I love that because when you think about uh, that, he's a wonderful counselor. Remember um, that Trinity is God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. The counselor is often what we think of as the Holy Spirit who is given as our counselor and our helper. The mighty God, Jesus is one with God the Father. He is mighty. We'll see that might um, in how he conquered death. We'll see that might and power um, in Revelation when he comes back on, um, and he's that conquering warrior, that conquering king. He is one with the Father, even though it says a child of will be born to us the son is given his name will also be everlasting father he is um, that image of god who is our father and he is also the prince of peace he is everything we would need and aren't we so thankful you know i think about this as i've told you before as a christmas verse but this is a year round day in day out he is everything we need he's our counselor he's our mighty god he's our our father he is our uh 
provider of the peace. You know, he's the source of our hope, the source of our strength, the source of our peace. And he truly is our all in all. But I love that this was written some 700 years before Jesus was born. God gave this to their prophet Isaiah. And isn't that such a blessing that we have this here? And and we can trust him and we can be thankful that he has given us uh, this Jesus whose name is above all names, whose um, every knee will bow at the name of Jesus and at this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting or eternal father and prince of peace. I am so thankful. Can you give him the thanks? Can you give him the praise for who he is and what he's done and what he will do? Blessings to you, friends. Until next time.